16 and so I did the fatherly thing as you would expect a father to do. I sat down next to her, I put my arm around her and I said, you know Amy, this is your first boyfriend and don't get too attached because it may all go wrong. She got so angry with me. Whatever, <laughs> this is going to last. And it has because that boyfriend she had at age 16 is John. <laughs> Because John had to had to earn the right to uh, to be worthy. Not not that he listened anyway. Um, but uh, after they'd been going out for a little while, we had some very tall, ugly trees in our garden that were shadowing the whole garden and needed to come down. And fortuitously, John came to visit us when I got the chainsaw out. Uh, the chainsaw wasn't for John, but he, he came and he worked that day. He worked so hard. He helped cut into that tree. He was helping to try and get the roots out. He was helping with the car loads of tree that we took to the dump. And at the end of it, I said to him, John, you are worthy. <laughs> There's, there's something that John actually needs to understand about Amy. A Amy grew up a very happy child, um, but she was also very determined in what she would or she wouldn't do. When she was just a toddler, in fact, when we were living in Priestwood just down the road here, she can't have been more than 18 months old, and uh, she decided that she would climb to the top of the climbing frame, the, her brother's climbing frame, and, and she did it. She couldn't get down again, but she, she climbed up and she was at the top. She knew when she's determined to do something, she will do it. And being the youngest of three, um, she always wanted to be part of what her brothers were doing. And uh, Louisa and I have certainly got distinct memories of her playing with her brothers in the back garden down in Cornwall in Trithal. We had a very large back garden 
and the brothers like playing cowboys and Indians and all sorts of outdoor games. And on the one occasion, we looked out the kitchen window to see the two brothers with a potato sack over Amy's head and a rope around her, <laughs> leading her up and down. <laughs> it wasn't that she wasn't beautiful, it's just it was some game they were, they were playing and she wanted to be a part of, of their game. I, I used to take her biking when, when she was little. In, in the first place, we, we had, I had a kiddie carrier on the back of my bike for her and she would sit on the back. And she would sing to me as we went along. I didn't need a radio. She, she would just sing her happy little Sabbath school songs and so on. I don't know what the passers-by thought. Um, and uh, in fact, she, she enjoyed being on the back of the mountain bike, especially if Louisa wasn't around. Because uh, if Louisa wasn't doing, you know, wasn't looking, we would do the jumps and the steep hills and, and so on. And, and she would scream with delight, or at least scream. Uh, then as she got older, she, she got her own bike. Um, five years old, she got this beautiful little pink bicycle for her fifth birthday, which she was so proud of, had stabilizers on it, and started riding it. I can show you photos. Um, and then of course the stabilizers come off, and at that stage, that's the stage where Dad has to go along beside the bike with a hand on the back to make sure she doesn't fall off. And although she was determined, she was also cautious. And I, I do remember a day, I don't know if the Blackburns remember this, at Cardinham Woods, where we went biking, and I think she actually moved up to a slightly bigger bike, and she could ride it, but she hadn't got the confidence. And she said, Daddy, you have got to help me along here. And so I just left my bike on the bank, and I held her on the shoulder, and she started riding, and riding, and faster and faster, I was running beside her, and eventually she just took off and she was gone and I had to run a mile back to get my bike. <laughs> but when she wants to do something, she, she will do it. Um, and in fact, this is another warning for you, John. Um, she has always managed to get her way with the men in her lives. You know, what, what, whatever it is. Um, her, her grandfather, Avó, the Portuguese grandfather, um, is a case in point. Um, we most often went to Portugal to visit the, the in-laws, but several times they came over to visit us. And um, when Amy was again small, they came to Cornwall, and uh, our house in Cornwall was a three-bedroom railway cottage, so there wasn't room for an office. My office was a static caravan in the back garden. And Avor smoked, so clearly you know, he went outside to have his smoke, and he decided that the garage was his office. So I had my office, Avor had his office, but Amy thought that Avor would be lonely. And so when he went out for his cigarette, then Amy would go out and keep him company. And uh, Avor was very shy. You can't believe how shy he was. And yet, with Amy, he would sing, he would play games with her, he would do anything with her. You know, um, this is uh, Louisa's grandma here, Avor. I hope you can hear the difference in the sound. Sorry. Yeah, Louise's mother, Amy's grandmother, I uh, And she had never heard her husband sing, but Amy got him singing. So, John? <laughs> it was also in those, in those formative years that Amy developed her love of books. And um, it may have started off with Mr. Men and Edith Blyton. Um, but Amy's always enjoyed a good read, and uh, was never happier than if either she was reading or someone was reading to her. And my mother, when she came on holiday, she would read to Amy for hours, and I'm sure that's part of where your love of reading came from. And um, Friday evenings for us, um, with all three children, was often reading a serial story to them, and there was always pleading at the end of the chapter, can we have another chapter please? Well now Amy gets through a book in a night. And uh, we obviously did too good a job. On Thursday, we helped her move house. <laughs> and my back is still aching. And it is only for carrying the books. <laughs> we've not only lost a daughter, we've lost a library. <laughs> <laughs> well, I gained the bathroom. And gained the bathroom, all my time. Okay, well, 
as I as I told you, I, I was the concerned and and uh, protective father and told her she shouldn't have a boyfriend until she was 21. But she didn't listen. Here's John. And indeed, we've discovered that they are deeply in love and, and equally discovered quite seriously that uh, they're very compatible. And uh, you know, we've, we've come to love John dearly. So um, we're delighted to welcome you into the family, John. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, John has got many, many strengths. If you want a good debate, yeah. he is your man. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, and he knows whether you're right or wrong. He just wants to debate. And, and he will come and he will discuss with you. John, John's been on a number of holidays with us as well. And, and we've enjoyed those holidays. He always brings a sense of adventure with him. He's not scared when we go to Portugal. If he's got three words of Portuguese, he will use them. It doesn't matter whether it's for the appropriate thing, but he'll use them. And he'll, you know, we, we went for a meal in a restaurant, and he had about three words, and he basically walked up to the cashier and said, he's paying. And, uh, <laughs> so obviously your parents taught you well. Also. Um, he has got one failing. He has got one failing. In 2007, they'd only been going out for a while, and we went on a holiday to the Lake District, and we were camping. And as you know, with camping, there is no soundproofing. And uh, we were in our trailer tent together, and we discovered that John snores. He snores enough that the cows in the next field were scared. And, you know, after that holiday, I said to Amy, you know, how do you feel about this now you've made this great discovery? But she loves him, you know? And uh, anyway, I'm suspicious that actually the very trim figure that you see of John today is that people that get slimmer snore less. Yeah. So I don't know whether somebody's got to stand outside for seven days to, uh, to test this theory, but... Um, Hopefully, John Snare snores less than he did in 2007. I hope that's true for Amy's sake. Uh, but equally, the fact that you know John and Amy enjoy coming on holiday with us is something special to us. Because um, you know, often your children get to a certain age and, oh, you're going to that boring place again? Oh, you're going to do those boring things again? But they actually enjoy coming with us. And we enjoy, we love having them with us. And, and I think that shows another characteristic of both of them, and that is that they don't believe in generation gaps. I think you actually see that looking around this room, and I've been looking at different people, and even going through the wedding list with them, and you know, trying to reduce the number of names coming to the reception, they were very resistant. And as you can tell, those around the corner there. Um, but, you know, to have John and Amy feeling important yeah, to, to have esteemed people like Pam and Terry, you know, of, of that vintage. So, <laughs> for, for, for Amy and John to consider them as a friend, yeah, that's really great. And we love it. And, and I, I, I could name some others, but then I might get chased out of the room. And um, I won't deserve it. Um, yes. It's very hard for fathers to say goodbye. Yeah. And... Um, I did find it hard this morning, and I, I, I've advised Patrick when the time comes that Patrick does not do the wedding vows for his daughter, because when you come to the end of those vows and you read Amy Louise Holbert for the last time as her legal name, and she becomes Amy Louise Ainsworth, it does something to her to a father's heartstrings. Um, but we got through that. I hope you didn't notice the blip in the uh, proceedings at that time. But to balance that, we are sincerely delighted that, um, that John is, is part of our family now. And actually, not just John, but um, parents as well. Looks like you've already adopted him. <laughs> is this a premonition or something? <laughs> this isn't in my script. <laughs> just practicing. Just practicing. <laughs> But it's, it's great you know, to have Ogbed and Basina and, and the other members of, of the family um, to get to know you both better as well and for allowing your son to join our family as indeed your daughter, our daughters joined, joined yours. Um, and so really, ladies and gentlemen, 
Um, without further ado, I don't know if you've got anything in your glasses. If you haven't, then just pretend. But I'd like to ask you to raise your glasses in a toast to the happy couple, to Amy and John. Cambridge, 
and then I just rearranged this whole weekend and so uh, I think there's a lot of you that have probably done that. So thank you very much and thanks for bringing all this food. Because you guys have brought it, it's really good. Um, we would also like to thank all our friends and family who helped to make today possible. Um, we were here until quite late last night setting up, uh, I think it was a miraculous event. <coughs> the amount of the drastic change that happened here within a couple of hours, I don't know how it happened. I went in there, I came back, it was changed. Uh, all you guys made this happen, it's amazing. Thanks very much. Um, I want to thank um, Victor and Louisa for letting me marry their only daughter. <laughs> and I want to assure you that um, I'll look after her. Um, um, yeah, Victor and Louisa have really helped out in arranging this wedding and helping us move to move house. Uh, it's been so much happening recently that it would be impossible without them moving us with cars, lifts, all the rest of it. So thank you very much. Um, I want to thank my parents for bringing me up in such a way that Amy would fall hopelessly in love with me. <laughs> Well done, and thank you very much. <laughs> uh, they've also helped us move house and arrange the wedding and everything, so a lot of help from them too, thank you. Um, I want to thank the bridesmaids, you guys look amazing today uh, in both outfits. I really like the um, that they're not exactly the same, that they are different. It just looked really nice, I had the best view I think standing at the front where I could just see every single dress was slightly different and it just looked really good. Um, thanks for helping Amy out with getting ready, arranging her hen do, all that kind of stuff. It's really helpful, thanks. Um, I want to thank the groomsmen for being the amazing people they are, uh, for arranging the go-karting and I think that was another miraculous event that actually happened because it almost didn't. <laughs> so, thanks for that. Um, um, I've grown up with these guys, and I wouldn't be the person I am today without the trials they put me through. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for the character building. <laughs> uh, last but not least, I would like to thank Amy for agreeing to marry me. <laughs> uh, Amy is very beautiful and lovely and intelligent and kind and compassionate. I could go on, but I, I can't read the rest of her writing. <laughs> Mostly because you're my best friend, and I can't wait to live the rest of my life with you. I want to uh, thank everyone else who's helped make the wedding 
uh, what it's been, it's been really beautiful. And um, finally, I want to thank everyone else who, who came along. It was great to have so many people here. Um, I want to echo what John said about the bridesmaids. They look really, really great today, and they're only surpassed rightly by Amy, who I think we'll all agree looks stunning. So, I'm really glad to be here today with my friend John and to see him get married. Me and John went to school together for almost eight years and I was actually with John when he first started thinking about approaching Amy. Uh, and there were, there were fun times. Um, right after John and Amy got to, together, John was noticeably different. And this was even picked up on by our maths teacher. Um, actually, in the middle of an A-level class, he s stopped and asked her in front of everyone, John, is everything okay? You seem, you seem like there's something wrong. And John said, no, no, everything's, everything's fine. And, but he didn't give up, he kept going. And he said, is there, is there trouble at home? Is, is that what it is? <laughs> John said, no, no, everything's okay. And, um, and then he asked, is it, are you worried about exams? And John said, no, no, it's fine. Um, and then he said, aha, have you fallen in love? <laughs> At which point I decided to interrupt and say, I think you've struck gold, sir. <laughs> um, but anyway, ever since John has been together with Amy, he's, he's been really happy and it's just great to be here today to see them um, declare their commitment to each other for the rest of their lives. Um, so I'm not married myself, so I'm not in a position to give them advice, um, so I will give them the advice to someone else, um, of any young one. So this is what he says. Some people ask the secret of our long marriage, and this is what it is. We take the time to go to a restaurant twi twice a week, a little candle at dinner, soft music, some dancing. She goes Tuesdays, I go Fridays. <laughs> some evenings after a day's working in the Lahore AWR studio, helping them with maths and English. One day out of the blue, I asked John, who was barely nine at the time, so which language do you prefer, English or Urdu? John paused for a moment 
and then answered the question in a well-structured, logical and concise manner as to why he preferred English over Urdu. Despite the fact that he, at his age and in that context, spent most of his days speaking Urdu. Phil says, I was quite stunned by his lucid and honest response to the proposition with his references to difference in gender forms and grammar rules and comparing the two languages. And I guess it was an early indicator of two things. One, the ability to think clearly and form a cognant argument. And two, his orientation towards English as the preferred language for communication. Both inclinations have led him in good stead to bring to the point in his life where he finds himself today. Um, he's also sent you a present. We're not opening presents this evening, with one exception. And um, this exception came oh, on Friday. He sent it to our address as a surprise for you, John, and I've paid the customs duty on it. <laughs> So you can, you can start to open that between you. He lives in Perth, but he went to Fremantle to buy this special Australian thing for John. Uh, on the beachfront overlooking the Indian Ocean, popular place for visitors. He went there. Have you worked out what it is? Yeah, lift, lift it out of the box. Yeah, if there's a knife around, it may help. Okay. Oh, Dad to the rescue, you see. Fathers are still needed. <laughs> All right. Any clues, anybody? You can rip that paper off. Okay. <laughs> While he's ripping it off, we'll give him another chance. John, uh, Phil says that he wanted to choose this particular one for you, John, because it has similarities to one he's got himself. He says it's each, each one of these is unique. They're made by the Aborigines. They're, made, they're not made by the, He's lied because his next sentence says termites eat the eucalyptus branch and hollow them out. So it's the termites that actually made these. And then the Aborigines do something with them. Okay? They're used in traditional dances and tribal gatherings where Aborigines tell stories of their dream time and their ancestors with dance and songs. Okay? So you can now see what it is. All right. I'm not reading you the rest of it. I'll give you a. I'll email it to you. Um, but what he wants to tell you is he's chosen this one, which produces the note D, and he's chosen it because his own one in Australia produces the note D. He wants to stay in harmony with you. The other thing he wants to do. Okay, and this is important. You're not allowed to blow it quite yet. The other thing he wants you to remember is you're about to blow it and, and no doubt produce a perfect note first time, and apparently take some practice, but I've never tried, is that the last person that has blown that was Uncle Phil. <laughs> so he wants you to know that he sends his kisses and best wishes <laughs> to you and to Amy. And this is your moment, the camera is rolling. Let's hear the sound of a didgeridoo for Uncle Phil and his family. <laughs> so that was either a D or a kiss. Greetings from Uncle Phil and his wife and all the family to, to the two of you.